A very good evening and welcome to Primetime News on TV1. We've got the latest lined up for you from here at home and across the globe. I'm Charlotte Benedict for the News First team. A very good evening. I am Rahna Farooq. Let's start off with a look at your headlines for tonight. CPC instructs the Petco filling stations to sell fuel at previous price. Lanka IOC says it has not been instructed to reduce fuel prices. Uday R. Seniviratna assumes duties as secretary to the president. Minister Mangala Samaravira challenges former president over New York Times expose. Former Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif sentenced to 10 years in jail. Appearing on the Newsline program this morning, a senior lawyer, Gomin Dayashri, elaborated on commissions of inquiry. Presidential commissions of inquiry. Are these serving any earthly purpose? Examples. Number one, cast your mind back. 17th of March 2015, Prime Minister Rani Vikram Singh arrives in Parliament, gives a statement. He says, I insisted on the change of the system in the way bonds were being issued because in the previous government there was corruption. The key words there, I insisted on the change. Roll back, go forward a little bit. Arjuna Mahendran goes to court and he confirms. He says, all I did was to follow the instructions of the Prime Minister. Roll the clock forward a bit. The Presidential Commission of Inquiry, two Supreme Court judges on that panel. They say in one part of the report, I think page 917, now then it says there that there is no evidence that the Prime Minister asked Mahendran to break the rules. Come on. That's a little bit like going Now, second example. It involves you. Gomin Dasri goes to the Supreme Court, intervenes and on the 19th Amendment, and Govindasar is asking, or asking the, posing the question that if it was in its, that form, that the people's franchise will be on hold for four and a half years, they can't have parliamentary election. Asoka for, De Silva. Asoka De Silva, Chief Justice then, what does he say? He, he, does, he ignores that question, and he gives a, an order saying that the president, under the constitution, under that relevant section, can appoint whoever he deems fit to be the treasury secretary. Again, a question of Kohede Yanne Malipol, the Batalanda Commission. What happened there? There you are. Now the question is, do we need commissions of inquiry? I, I, commissions of inquiry are a provision in the law which need them, but we don't, the way they have acted is very suspicious. May I put it this way? Let us take Asoka de Silva's case. Where did Asoka de Silva end? He became the, he became a stooge of the present, of the last government. He became an advisor to Mahindra Rajapaksa. Is that a post that a chief justice of any repute should take on? after he retires, when he has gets the full salary as pension for the purpose that he doesn't do any other appointment except give legal advice, may sit on another commission. But he, they are not expected to go as ambassadors. They are not expected to become presidential advisors. Second case, that was the case of, uh, that was, uh, as far as the petition, 19th Amendment is concerned, I'm the guy who, I'm the petitioner. It's yeah. Dias reverse State. Yeah. And I submitted very strenuously that the 14th Amendment takes away the franchise of the people which affects the uh, fundamental rights of the people for four and a half years. It can I have a yes or no answer? Does the Prime Minister have a moral right to carry on in the light of the bond scam? answer is very simple. He has no right whatsoever. He should leave, but he won't. He'll be booted out. Thank you very much. Govind Asri, back from the Caribbean. Do share your program. <laughs> In more local news, the Government Information Department announced this evening that a decision was reached to sell fuel at the previous prices. The Ceylon Petroleum Corporation and Lanka IOC took measures to increase fuel prices with effect from midnight yesterday. However, this evening the CPC decided to sell fuel at prices before the increase with immediate effect. 
Director General of the Government Information Department, Sudarshan Gunawardena, said the CPC chairman had issued the respective circular along with the guidelines. Oh. A fuel price increase was announced last night. With immediate effect from midnight yesterday, CPC had sold fuel at those prices. However, now the president had given the CPC an order to sell fuel at the previous price. One question is, will there be a refund to those who already made purchases? What decision will be made on that? Was cabinet approval obtained for this? What measures will be taken to reduce the price as per the president's directive while the CPC has already increased the prices? The government must make it clear to parliament. This is a situation which was experienced at a filling station in Kurunagala which sold fuel at the increased price this evening. Fuel supplied by the CPC was sold as per the previous price across filling stations located in Mathura, Anuradhapura and Kandy. Filling station employees said as they could not calibrate the meter as per the increased price, they were compelled to sell fuel as per the previous price. Siddharth Agarwal, Senior Vice President of Lanka IOC, said there will be no revision to the fuel prices increased by them. Filling station managers also noted they have not been instructed by the IOC to revise the fuel prices. Uh, IOC, I IOC has not informed us yet to reduce the prices of fuel. However, Sipetco has reduced their prices. We are prepared to bring down the prices as soon as they inform us. <laughs> I have a statement which was released by the acting sales manager of CPC, Sipetco, WD Abegunordana, sent to all Sipetco distributors over the price revision. As per the agreement that you have signed with us, you cannot revise the fuel prices without any written approval from the CPC. It notes they cannot revise the fuel prices based on the reports published in the media. It will be viewed as a serious violation of the agreement. It notes, though the newspaper claims the prices have been increased, as per the agreement, fuel prices cannot be increased. Who is accountable for this? The finance ministry says the fuel prices were increased. The president says fuel prices will be sold as the previous price. The CPC says await instructions. Sipetco has not told to increase the price as well. Therefore, all the licenses of the distributors have to be cancelled for increasing prices without the approval of Sipetco. The distributors need not be accountable when there is a government. Fuel prices were increased yesterday. It was reduced today. Following the issue of the Gazette, injustice was caused to those who purchased fuel at 12 midnight. The president goes to sleep at 10 and after he wakes up, he sees that the prices have been increased. It must be after he saw it in the newspapers that the president decided to reduce the price. At a time when there is no consensus in the government, the Prime Minister does one thing and the President does another. If the Prime Minister brought in the Gam Peralia, the President brought in the Gram Shakti program. This evening, the Ministry of Finance and Mass Media issuing a statement said fuel prices were revised as per the powers given to the Cabinet appointed committee based on the price revision formula. It adds, based on this process, institutions engaged in the sale of fuel can revise their prices. The statement added the next Cabinet meeting would discuss the prices of fuel sold by the CPC. Senior Administrative Officer Uday R. Selmi Ratna was appointed as the new Secretary to the President. The post of Secretary to President was left vacant following Austin Fernando's resignation yesterday. Uday R. Selmi Ratna assumed duties as the new Secretary to the President today. Selmi Ratna is a Senior Administrative Officer who served as Secretary to the Ministries of Science and Technology, Sports, Highways and Investment as well as Environment and Mahavali Development. In addition, he held the position of additional secretary at several ministries and boasts of 37 years of experience in the state sector. Seneviratna was instrumental in establishing the National Institute of Cooperative Development in Polgola, rendering his service to a number of large-scale projects in the country. President Maitri Pala Sirisena held a meeting with the students of Saitam and their parents today.
The meeting took place at the Nelumpukuna Theatre in Kilambo and saw the participation of parliamentarians, ministers and intellectuals. In the past three years, the university students flocked the roads from time to time and at times two to three days a week. I was accused in profanity by the public and especially from the drivers who were affected badly by the congestion in the roads. I always used to call the IGP soon as I wake up, urging him not to carry any weapons for protest in case the students had planned to hold a protest. I have always urged the IGP to retreat if the police are unable to control the situation or if there's a threat to the students' lives. I have instructed the police to take legal measures if the students had caused damage to any public or private property and not to harm any student. I'm the only one who convened the most number of meetings, more than the relevant ministers, in the past three years in order to solve this matter. I held a meeting with the students of Inter-University Students Union, but some accused me, saying that this issue cannot be solved by having meetings with the student union. Deputy Minister Ranjan Ramanayaka made yet another revelation surrounding the New York Times expose. A certain sum of money had been deposited to the foundation of former Minister Basil Rajapaksa's wife, Pushpa Rajapaksa. The figure is just over 19 million. The bank listed here is the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation Limited. It is dated the 21st of May 2012. This was exposed by the US-based New York Times newspaper. It is this newspaper that reported that $7.6 million was given for Mahinda's election campaign as well as $38,000 given to Allegunu Ansathero. They have been put forward as Chinese bribes. I am expecting an answer to this from attorney at law Namal Rajapaksa, who scored the highest mark, as well as from former President Mahindra Rajapaksa. I hope they would respond to this allegation with a direct answer. Yesterday, the Chinese embassy officials and representatives from the China Harbour had hosted a meeting with a selected group of journalists to elaborate on the matter. According to the BBC Singhala service, China Harbour Engineering Company had refuted the allegations. The company representative has said Sri Lanka police had carried out an inquiry in 2015 and China Harbour Engineering Company provided its complete support for the investigation. I am not aware of any CID investigation. However, the allegations made by the New York Times is serious. While there is an allegation citing that millions of dollars were given to former President Mahindra Rajapaksa's election campaign before the election, there is another allegation which states a monk was given $38,000. The monk in question has already confirmed this fact. He said that an unknown Chinese man had given the money and left. If the monk is accepting one of the two main allegations published in the New York Times, it is impossible for us to claim that the other allegation is false. If this happened to me, I would take legal action against the New York Times newspaper to protect my reputation. I would clear my name through legal means. It appears that they are not moving towards such process. However, GL Pierce goes on to say that legal action will be taken against the local newspaper that reported on the facts published by that newspaper. The draft of the National Audit Bill was passed in Parliament with amendments yesterday. However, it appears certain amendments that were added and passed would pose an impact on the entire audit process. It was proposed in the draft audit bill that a surcharge should be imposed on those responsible for financial crimes in order to recover the monies lost and the power to do so was to be given to the Auditor General. However, as per the bill which was passed yesterday, the final decision maker on imposing a surcharge are the heads of departments of ministries. This is a completely different bill to what was initially produced by the Auditor General. That is why we put forward 16 amendments and attempted to have the initial matter included in it. However, we could not reach the level that we required on the matter. Imposing a surcharge on public servants responsible for financial irregularities was viewed as a power given to the Audit Commission and the Auditor General. However, sadly, it has been moved to the ministry secretaries as per the deeds of the politicians. After the amendments, the situation was such that matters would have not been reported to the Audit Commission. However, our amendments were that they need to be reported. There is no major change on the matter of the surcharge. Once again, the person who imposes it has to be defined as the secretary. However, preparing the surcharge and implementing the initial steps on the matter remain with the Auditor General as his task. 
There is no serious issue with it. However, we can say that there is a difference with the initial bill that was put forward. The matter of carrying out internal audits have been taken away from the Auditor General. We view this as a serious flaw. Article 9 previously noted that the Auditor General can perform an audit on private institutions for the betterment of the nation. But that too has been removed. There was no view on a minimum fine. We were able to increase the minimum fine from 5,000 rupees to 25,000 rupees. Yet the 100,000 rupee fine is now 25,000 rupees. The government introduces legislation to impose fines. But this time they have removed it and paved the way for theft to take place. Those are their amendments. It is clear that they had no intention of bringing forward this bill to strengthen the state mechanism and good governance. There was a small group that always protected those who committed fraud and corruption in the country. They dragged this matter for 15 years. When this legislation was moved to Parliament in 2003, the Prime Minister was Ranil Vikramasinghe. And when it was presented to Parliament yesterday, the Prime Minister was Ranil Vikramasinghe. However, they could have put a stop to misappropriation in those 15 years. Yet the institution which simply wasted 2 million rupees per month for the past three years will become a fully functional institution from tomorrow. The Sirisa media allocated a time period for the audit bill every week. We must note they perform a duty towards this nation. You have performed a task on behalf of the nation. The department and the 20 million people of this country salute you. The Colombo High Court judge Gihan Kulathungu today sentenced a person found guilty of eight indictments, including soliciting a bribe of 10,000 rupees from a private bus owner. His sentence, 40 years of rigorous imprisonment to be served in five years. The case was filed by the Bribery Commission against the defendant for soliciting a bribe from a private bus owner on the 12th of October 2015 while he was serving as the operations manager at the Western Provincial Passenger Transport Authority. In addition to the sentence of imprisonment for five years, he was also ordered to pay a compensation of 500,000 rupees to the private bus owner. An additional two years of rigorous imprisonment will be added to the sentence if the convict fails to pay the fine. The judge also ordered the return of the bribe of 10,000 rupees and separately imposed a penalty of 40,000 rupees. The Organised Crimes Prevention Division informed the Colombo Chief Magistrate Aranga Disanayaka today that it can be observed that action can be filed under the Penal Code against the statement made by former State Minister Vijayakala Maheshwaran. Vijayakala Maheshwaran, speaking at an event in Jaffna, espoused the cause of the LTTE. The Organised Crimes Prevention Division informed court that action can be taken against the statement made by Vijayakala Maheshwaran under Article 115 and 120 of the Penal Code of the Constitution of Sri Lanka which falls under the amended Prevention of Terrorism Act. The Organised Crimes Prevention Division further informed court that the former State Minister had made the statement in the area falling under the jurisdiction of the Jaffna Court and thus the incident should be reported to the court that holds jurisdiction in this area. The Chief Magistrate also ordered all print and electronic media organizations to hand in all edited and unedited footage of the statement made by the former State Minister on the 2nd of July 2018 at the Singham Hall in Jaffna and all media reports related to the incident to the Organized Crimes Prevention Division. The General Secretary of the Sihala Rave Organization, Venerable Maliga Kande Sudat Thera, and Chairman of the organization, Lienage Abhiratna, filed a complaint at the police headquarters on the 3rd of this month requesting for legal action to be taken against the statement of Vijay Kala Maheshwaran as a statement incites disunity among racial and religious groups in the country. Uh, the excerpts of which we have seen reported have to have been made by uh, uh, Vijay Kala Maheshwaran, Honorable Parliamentarian. And it is reported, or the excerpt that we have seen, uh, it is reported that she was espousing or encouraging uh, a rule or a regime uh, or a governance by the LTTE, which has been a proscribed organization and a banned organization in several, in several areas of the world, and a terrorist organization recognized uh, globally and, and even locally. Uh, and, and, that, and, so, and that you want me to compare to the statements that uh, once again were reported some time back as said to have been made by another parliamentarian, an honorable MP, Mr. Malirwansa, with regard to uh, attempt to bomb the, uh, bomb the legislature. And you also wish that I compare that to a statement that has been said to have been made by Vishwara of the Medical Association to the extent that 
people should take up arms or the youth should take up arms now i see primarily i see a, a distinction between the first statement by uh, honorable parliamentarian vijay kala maheshwaran and the other two for the simple reason that when a parliamentarian assumes office they take an oath of office and that is uh, uh, swearing in terms of uh, of uh, of uh, wording that is uh, in the constitution in the sh- in a schedule to the constitution that uh, we as lawyers or even public servants they take an oath of office where they swear an oath that they will not directly or indirectly uh, espouse promote or encourage or discuss the creation of a separate state or the, or the, or the splitting of our present state and that they will they will uphold the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the country of the nation as a whole now that when you uh, when you make a statement that you uh, are encouraging the creation of uh, or, or even uh, uh, even encouraging a regime or a governance by the LTTE which has been recognized for its view that it wished to have a separate land within the state of sri lanka then that to me in my interpretation is a violation of the oath of office that you have taken and therefore there is a direct violation of the constitution and irrespective of what action you may take with regard to executive position that is as a minister or deputy minister but here we are discussing the legislative arm of government the parliament and i believe that she has violated the provision of the constitution in that of oath of office that she has taken and therefore she must be dealt with with regard to that now as regards the other two statements uh, i do not see a direct comparison because yes yeah, yeah, one may very well deal with uh, honorable member of parliament who has said that the parliament should be bombed but that to me it cannot uh, hold a direct uh, connection to a violation of a constitutional provision like the earlier instance similarly when a doctor or a lawyer or accountant makes a public statement we assume that one holds uh, particularly when you are a professional there is an element of trust that people place in you because of that position that you hold in society and that we refer to as a fiduciary duty uh, uh, in 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 uh, legal terms one is expected to be guided by the principle of prima facie which is utmost good faith which is a level above bona fide utmost good faith now if in such a position you issue statements particularly to young students or medical students who may be relying on statements that you make calling them to take up arms that i see is is a is a serious violation of your of your ethics and breach of your uh, office that you hold still in local news the udagaman model village constructed in mulathivu was vested with the public today under the auspices of deputy leader of the united national party minister sachit premadasa the village which is the 90th to be constructed under the samata sevana yalipi bidena udagamana program has been named nandkumar nagar the village comprises of 30 houses and was built at a cost of 52.4 million rupees this village has been equipped with access to clean drinking water electricity access roads and internal roads in line with the event title deeds and housing loans were handed over to the beneficiaries this is the constitution of the country and this is the law of the country everyone is subject to this the constitution notes that all persons are equal before the law and that no citizen shall be discriminated against on grounds of race religion language caste and political opinion there is no provision in the constitution to discriminate another group it is forbidden as mentioned in the constitution the state shall safeguard the independence sovereignty unity and territorial integrity of sri lanka we cannot allow that to be broken at any cost muna hedu gadawa mp wasudeva nanya kara has addressed a letter to the inspector general of police the digs of the cid and fcid as well as to the director general of the bribery commission The letter requests the authorities to take a legal action over questionable transactions that are said to have taken place in the past. The letter questions as to why the directions of the Supreme Court have not been followed with regard to certain matters, including the Water Edge deal, the Lanka Marine Services deal, and the deal for the privatization of Sri Lanka Insurance Corporation. News First will be reporting the details of these individual deals and transactions in the future. MP Anurag Kumar of Desa Nayaka was interrupted while making a statement to parliament thereafter he expressed the following views
garu kata na ekatu mani. Karuna kaude parliament we. Ara garu kata na ekatu mani sari. Honorable Speaker, though some are physically developed, their brains are underdeveloped. We experience such situations in parliament. They come here and speak on things that need to be told to an infant with a pacifier. There are some who speak with no respect. There are school children present here. This person needs to be placed in a cot. You just witnessed it. It appears he suffers from a brain disorder. I am aware that the entire family is suffering from that disease. The Sri Lanka chapter of the South Asian Free Media Association states that it is very concerned about the targeting by politicians of two Sri Lankan journalists involved in internationally reporting on Sri Lankan issues published recently in the New York Times newspaper of USA. The association raises concerns over the violation of professional rights of these journalists. They also express concern that the targeting is being done by senior leaders of a political group that when it was last in governmental power presided over a regime that saw the collective intimidation and repression of the news media industry by extreme violence. The statement adds that the public naming of these two journalists last week remarkably echoed that period of repression and the behavior of politicians that heralded such massive rights violations and violence. The association further notes that this political criticism has sparked off a wave of similar or even worse criticism of these two individual professionals why internet social media is indicative of an attempt to intimidate Sri Lanka's news professional community as a whole. In more news from courts, Fort Magistrate Lanka Jayaratna issued a travel ban on four directors of the Edrisinghe Trust Investment. The magistrate ordered Jivaka Edrisinghe, Deepa Edrisinghe, Nalaka Edrisinghe and Asanka Edrisinghe to appear in court on the 17th of this month. The magistrate ordered for the travel ban to be immediately communicated to the Immigrations and Emigrations Controller. The order was issued after the magistrate considered the representations made by the Attorney General. The Attorney General's department made representations based on a complaint filed by a financial institution that is not a bank under the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. In the complaint, the director of the financial institution alleges that the ETI institutions had been operating in defiance of financial regulations since the year 2012. Now let's take a look at today's illustrated news by Asanka Ladwahetti. The special three-day convention of Jehovah's Witnesses commenced at the Sugadadasa Stadium in Colombo this morning. Around 2,800 delegates from seven countries are attending the conference while 11,000 Sri Lankan Jehovah's Witnesses will also be attending. They will be spending three days of prayer to learn more about the Bible. The theme for this year's convention is Be Courageous. And in a look at sports news, tonight France won quarterfinal game one of the FIFA World Cup 2018. They beat Uruguay 2-0. France therefore progressed to the semi-finals. Brazil take on Belgium in the quarterfinal game two late tonight. And that's all the news we've got for you tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Charlotte Benedict for the News First team. Thank you for watching. I'm Rahna Farooq. Have a pleasant night.